Hello, and welcome to The Secret Sits. Today I am going to take you on a journey through one of the most talked about true crime cases in Connecticut's history. And I will tell you now, it is quite a ride. So sit back, relax, and learn about the murder of Martha Moxley. Mischief Night is an informal holiday when people of all ages, but predominantly adolescents, engage in pranks, jokes, and have parties. You may have also heard of this referred to as Devil's Night, depending on where you live. Mischief Night is also celebrated at different times of the year, depending on where you live. For an example, in Connecticut, where our story today takes place, Mischief Night is held on October 30th, the night before Halloween. But in other countries, it takes place in May. Our story today begins on October 30th, 1975. Martha Elizabeth Moxley was 15 years old and living in Greenwich, Connecticut. And she left her home that evening to celebrate Mischief Night with her friends. The kids in this area typically celebrated by TPing neighbors' houses, playing Ding Dog Ditch, and other innocuous pranks. I mean, this is the 1970s we're talking about, and this is an extremely wealthy neighborhood as well. Truly bad things typically just did not happen here. This exclusive neighborhood of Bell Haven was a gated community with security guards who had been doubled on this evening in case the hijinks got out of hand. From accounts given by Martha's friends, Martha spent the evening flirting with Thomas Skakel. Thomas had a younger brother who, like Martha, was 15. Thomas was just two years older at 17 years old. During the course of their evening spent together, Martha grew affectionate toward the boy and may have even kissed him. The last time that Martha's friends saw her on this night was around 9.30 p.m., as the two flirtatious youngsters disappeared behind the fence to the Skakel's backyard and pool area. At approximately 9.45 p.m., Martha left the Skakel home. She lived just 150 yards away, a short walk across an expansive backyard. Martha's father, David, was away on a business trip, and only her mother remained at home. Her mother, called Dorothy, noticed that Martha had not arrived home when expected, but she was not overly concerned, until she woke up at 2 a.m. to find that Martha was still not home. Now Dorothy was worried, and she began to call all of Martha's friends to try and locate the girl, but no one knew where Martha was. Dorothy contacted the police, and a search of the neighborhood ensued. At around 12 noon, on October 31st, a 15-year-old friend and classmate of Martha's named Sheila McGuire found Martha's lifeless body in a clump of bushes on the Moxley property. The girl, once young and full of life, lay dead on the ground. Her pants and underwear pulled down and pieces of a broken six-iron golf club lay near her body. Martha Moxley was just 5 feet 5 inches tall. She weighed just 120 pounds and had long, naturally blonde hair. She had been well-liked by her classmates at the Greenwich High School. Her classmates got together and composed a eulogy, which would be read at Martha's funeral. One of the Moxley's family friends, Rosemary Mean, said, A year after arriving, she was sports editor of the yearbook, voted girl with the best personality, had gained scholastic honors, and had won letters for field hockey and basketball. This was a girl with ambition and drive, and she was going places in life. Martha's mother, Dorothy, remembers her precious daughter as chatty, to say the least. Dorothy said, Martha would come home from school and she would come into the kitchen where I was, and she would talk and talk and talk. Oh my God, she told me everything that went on. 
This particular area of Connecticut, called Bellhaven, juts out into Long Island Sound. Like I said, it is an expensive area of the country. House prices around Greenwich today average around $2.7 million. But in this specific subdivision, house prices average $6.3 million. This was a neighborhood for influential families, families with a lot of financial assets and families with a lot of connections. Martha's father, David, was the head of the New York office of the accounting company Touche Ross and Company. An autopsy was performed and found that Martha had not been sexually assaulted, but she had been bludgeoned with the golf club, and then, after it had broken, she was stabbed with the instrument through her neck. Thomas Skakel had been the last person seen with Martha on the night she was murdered. So quite obviously, he quickly became the prime suspect in the case. His father actively prevented access to the boy's school records and his medical records. You see, both Thomas, who went by Tommy, as all guys did in the 70s, and his little brother, Michael, had both had emotional issues, which had led to outbursts, and they were also not doing well on their academic route either. Another suspect popped up in the form of Kenneth Littleton. He was a science teacher, and he had just begun working for the Skakel family as a live-in tutor for the boys. And I do mean he had just begun working there. In fact, he had only arrived a few hours prior to the murder. So here was a young man that no one knew very well. He shows up, and just a few hours later, a murder happens in this rich suburban hamlet. Ken, as he liked to be called, said that at the time of the murder, he was watching The French Connection on television and that Tommy had joined him for a while after leaving Martha to walk home. Ken was not immediately a suspect, but during the summer after the murder, his behavior suddenly became erratic and he was arrested for burglary and larceny in Nantucket. Because of this, the Greenwich police began to look at him as a suspect. But a group of ex-FBI agents who ran a company called the Academy Group made a criminal profile of the killer in the Martha Moxley case, and they said it was not Ken. They claimed that the offender was an unsophisticated teenage male. Other characteristics include low self-esteem and an explosive temperament. He was likely enraged by rejection and inflicted a stab wound to Martha's neck to ensure her death. Ken claimed that the change in his behavior was due to the trauma of being harassed by the local police. Ken also believed that the police were relentless toward him because of the powerful Skagel family, who wielded enough influence to manipulate the police into doing their bidding. But no matter how many suspects there seemed to be, no one was charged with this crime, and it remained unsolved. This unsolved case did not stop writers from publishing several books about the murders, though. Dominic Dunn wrote a fictional version of the case in a book titled Season in Purgatory, which was released in 1993. You may remember the name Dominic Dunn from our episode on the Poltergeist movie curse, as he is the father of the murdered actress Dominic Dunn. Mark Furman wrote a non-fictional account called Murdering Greenwich. This book came to print in 1998. And finally, Timothy Dumas wrote a non-fiction book titled A Wealth of Evil. This book hit store shelves in 1999. The case continued to be investigated, and over the years, both Tommy and Michael Skakel seemed to significantly change their stories about the night of the murder. Michael made claims that he had been acting as a peeping Tom on the night of the murder and had masturbated while up in a tree beside the Moxley property sometime between 11.30 and 12.30 that night. 
after the murder of Martha Moxley, Michael was sent away to attend the Elon School in Poland Spring, Maine. The Elon School was a private boarding school which specializes in children with mental health and substance abuse problems. While attending this school, it is rumored by two students that Michael, during a group therapy session, confessed to the murder of Martha Moxley. One of these students, named Gregory Coleman, testified that Michael was given special privileges and that Michael had bragged, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. The school's owner denies this actually happened. Around this same time, Kim Littleton, who had begun abusing alcohol, moved to Canada and started hanging out with Mary Baker, who also had an alcohol abuse problem. In 1984, Mary claimed that Ken had begun identifying himself as Kenneth Kennedy and believed that he could cause a tornado by flushing a toilet. He began to eat money, he drank toilet water, and he stole golf carts and left them at synagogues and collected JFK matchbooks. Littleton's father said that the Greenwich Police Department had hounded and ruined his son, but the police chief, Thomas G. Keegan, denies these accusations. In the early 1980s, a crime writer named Leonard Levitt was hired by the Greenwich Time and The Advocate to investigate the murder of Martha Moxley. The piece Levitt wrote ended up being shelved, and it was not published until 1991. But when it came out, it helped to relaunch the police investigation into the murder. Now 1991, and a man named William Kennedy Smith, who was 30 years old at the time, was in a bar called Al Bar in Palm Beach, Florida. He was at this bar with his uncle, Senator Ted Kennedy, and his cousin, Patrick J. Kennedy. While at this bar, Smith met Patricia Bowman. The two eventually went to the nearby Kennedy house and went for a long walk along the beach. Bowman then claimed that Smith violently raped her. She called two friends at 4 a.m. to come and pick her up from the house, and they took her to a rape crisis center. She did present signs of rape, including sperm in her vagina and severe pain and bruising typically associated with rape. Smith claimed that the two had engaged in intercourse, but it had been consensual. Three more women came forward with allegations of being raped by Smith as well, but the trial judge excluded their testimony because the pattern of rape behavior reported was not similar enough to Bowman's rape claims. Smith was then acquitted on all charges. Now, why is this case important to the Martha Moxley murder case? Because after this trial, a rumor surfaced that William Kennedy Smith had been at the Skakel house on the night of Martha Moxley's murder, and there was an insinuation that he may have been involved. This rumor was found to be untrue, but it resulted in a new eye-opening investigation into the now cold case of Martha Moxley. A private detective agency called the Sutton Associates were hired by Rushton Skakel, and they conducted their own investigation. They compiled everything into a report, which would become known as the Sutton Report. This report was eventually leaked to the media, and in it, the detectives claim that both Thomas and Michael altered their stories about their activities on the night of the murder. Also in the report is a section about Tommy Skakel, which reads, Dr. Gramont has presented a series of objective findings which are somewhat alarming. While Dr. Gramont by no means suggests Tommy is a raging monster on the verge of a violent episode, the diagnosis is still very telling. It presents a great deal of insight into possible emotional and psychological disabilities that could have contributed to destructive behavior, and from which Tommy may still suffer 
to this day. When Mark Furman's book, Murder in Greenwich, came out in 1998, he named Michael Skakel as the assailant who perpetrated the murder. He also points out many mistakes the police made during their initial investigation. Now, June of 1998, and 23 years after Martha Moxley had her last day on this earth, something that I have never heard of before happened. The prosecutor for the Martha Moxley case requested a one-man grand jury. Judge George N. Thiem was selected as the lone juror and he spent the next 18 months sifting through transcripts and interviewing witnesses to determine if there was, in fact, enough evidence to bring Michael Skakel up on murder charges. When Thiem released his report, the Superior Court judge recommended the arrest of Michael Skakel for the slaying of 15-year-old Martha Moxley. In Connecticut, under provisions in the state law, a prosecutor can request this one-man grand jury when all other investigative procedures have failed. This is rarely used. It has actually only been done seven times between 1985 and 1997. In January of 2000, an arrest warrant was issued for Michael Skakel. Michael surrendered to authorities that day, and then he was released on $500,000 of bail. There were arguments made as to whether Michael should be tried as a juvenile or an adult. Considering he was a juvenile at the time of the murder, it was decided he would be arraigned in juvenile court. On January 31st, 2001, Judge Maureen Dennis ruled that Michael Skakel should be tried as an adult and ordered the case to be transferred to the Superior Court. The trial began on Tuesday, May 7th, 2002, in Norwalk, Connecticut. Michael Skakel was represented by his attorney, Michael Sherman. Michael's alibi was that he was at his cousin's house at the time of the murder. During the course of the trial, the jury heard part of the taped book proposal of Michael's when Michael Skakel said he was in the tree on the Martha Moxley property masturbating. In this book proposal, Michael never admitted to murdering Martha. The trial ended on June 7, 2002, and Michael Skakel was found guilty of the murder of Martha Moxley. He was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison, and he was remanded to the Garner Correctional Institute in Newtown, Connecticut. But this is far from the end of this case. Actually, this is where it gets kind of interesting. If you are familiar with this case, I'm sure by now you may be yelling at me through however you are listening to this podcast and telling me to explain more about Michael Skakel's family. So here we go. Michael Christopher Skakel is the fifth of seven children. He was born to Rushton Walter Skakel and Ann Reynolds. Rushton And no offense if this is your name, but you cannot be named Rushton and not be a millionaire. Rushton's sister is Ethel Kennedy, you know, widow of the famous United States Senator Robert F. Kennedy. Michael's grandfather, George, was the founder of the Great Lakes Carbon Corporation, which is one of the largest and wealthiest privately held coal corporations in the United States. After his mother's death from brain cancer in 1973, Skakel began abusing alcohol. He was a poor student and reportedly flunked out of a dozen schools. He also struggled for years with dyslexia, which went undiagnosed until he was age 26. Skakel's cousin, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., later wrote that he was a small, sensitive child, the runt of the litter with a harsh and occasionally violent alcoholic father who both ignored and abused him. According to neighbors and family friends, the Skakel children were given unlimited amounts of money and were largely unsupervised. In 1978, 
Skakel was arrested for drunk driving in New York State. To avoid criminal charges, his family sent him to the Elon School in Portland, Maine, where he purportedly received treatment for alcoholism. He ran away from the school twice before leaving after two years. Skakel later attended Curry College in Milton, Massachusetts, and earned a bachelor's degree in English. During the 1980s, he attended several drug rehabilitation facilities before finally becoming sober in his 20s. Skakel also pursued a career as a professional athlete. He competed on the international speed skiing circuit and tried out for the speed skiing demonstration team that appeared in the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville, France. In 1991, Skakel married professional golfer Margot Sheridan, with whom he has one child. Sheridan filed for divorce shortly after Skakel was arrested for Moxley's murder in January of 2000. Their divorce was finalized in 2001. In January 2003, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wrote a controversial article in the Atlantic Monthly entitled A Miscarriage of Justice, insisting that Skakel's indictment was triggered by an inflamed media and that an innocent man is now in prison. Kennedy argued that there was more evidence suggesting that Kenneth Littleton, the Skakel family's live-in tutor, had killed Moxley. He also called Dominic Dunn the driving force behind Skakel's prosecution. In July 2016, Kennedy released a book defending Skakel entitled Framed. Michael Skakel desperately fought his conviction, and in November of 2003, his appeal went to the Connecticut Supreme Court. The prime arguments Skakel's defense team were making for this appeal were based on the opinion that he should have been tried in juvenile court and that the statute of limitations had expired. There was also a claim of prosecutorial misconduct. The Connecticut Supreme Court rejected his claims and reaffirmed Michael Skakel's conviction. After this attempt failed, Michael Skakel retained a new attorney, Theodore Olson, who once served as the U.S. Solicitor General under former President George W. Bush. Olson filed a writ of certiotari on Skakel's behalf to the U.S. Supreme Court. This essentially means he asked the U.S. Supreme Court to review the case. On November 13, 2006, the Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Not one to give up, Skakel hired new attorneys in 2007. These new attorneys filed a petition for habeas corpus and filed motions for a new trial. Their petition gave an alternate theory about what had happened to Martha Moxley all those years ago. And let me tell you, this new theory is explosive. Skakel's defense team claimed the following. Gitano Tony Bryant, whose cousin was Kobe Bryant. Yes, that Kobe Bryant was a former classmate of Michael Skakel. In a videotaped interview from 2003, Bryant stated that on the night of Martha Moxley's murder, he and some friends were also out, and one of his companions stated that he wanted to rape Martha Moxley. Bryant also stated that he had not come forward earlier because his mother had warned him that as a black man, if he provided information, they would pin the murder on him. And I'll say, she was probably not wrong. Because of these new explosive theories, a two-week hearing took place in April of 2007. The court allowed the presentation of this hearsay evidence, and in September of that same year, Skakel's attorneys filed a petition for a new trial based on this new evidence. The prosecutor's office formal response to this was that they believed Bryant fabricated the story that he told to try and drum up buzz for a play he was currently writing about Martha Moxley's murder. 
on October 25, 2007, a superior court judge denied the request for a new trial, stating that he found Bryant's testimony was not credible and that there had been no proven evidence of prosecutorial misconduct during the original trial. This decision was then appealed to the state Supreme Court, where on April 12, 2010, a five-judge panel declined the appeal in a four-to-one decision. Still unwilling to accept the multiple court rulings against him, Skakel next appeals his sentence based on ineffective counsel. This would be against his original attorney, Michael Sherman. At a hearing in April of 2013, Michael Skakel testified that Sherman chose to bask in the limelight and attempted to obtain celebrity status by representing him and Skakel maintains that he did not focus on the actual defense of his case. Sherman did testify in his own defense during this hearing, and he maintained that he did focus on the case, and still believes that Michael Skakel was innocent. On January 24, 2012, Skakel and his attorneys argued for a reduction in his sentence. They maintained the claim that he should have been tried in juvenile court. Once again, his hopes were dashed when the court denied his bid for a sentence reduction. And then, almost out of nowhere, on October 23, 2013, Michael Skakel was granted a new trial by Connecticut Judge Thomas A. Bishop. Judge Bishop ruled that Sherman had, in fact, failed to adequately represent Skakel when he was convicted. In his ruling, Bishop wrote that defense in such a case requires attention to detail, an energetic investigation, and a coherent plan of defense, stating, Trial counsel's failures in each of these areas of representation were significant and ultimately fatal to a constitutionally adequate defense. As a consequence of trial counsel's failures, as stated, the state procured a judgment of conviction that lacks reliability. On November 21, 2013, Skakel was released on a $1.2 million bond along with other conditions. He was to be monitored with a GPS device. He could have no contact with Martha Moxley's family. He must periodically check in over the phone, and he would not be allowed to leave the state of Connecticut unless granted permission, although he had since relocated to Westchester County, New York. Then, in December 2016, the Connecticut Supreme Court reinstated Skakel's murder conviction with a 4-3 majority decision writing that his conviction was a result of overwhelming evidence presented by prosecutors and that his legal representation had been adequate. In January 2018, prosecutors asked the Connecticut Supreme Court to revoke Skakel's bail and to return him to prison to resume serving his sentence. However, on May 4th, the Connecticut Supreme Court vacated Skakel's conviction and ordered a brand new trial. The court ruled that Sherman had rendered ineffective assistance of counsel when he failed to contact an alibi witness whose name had been provided by Skakel and that as a result, Skakel was deprived of a fair trial. State prosecutors in Stanford have the power to call for a new trial against Skakel But on October 30th, 2020, Chief State's Attorney Richard Colangelo informed the Superior Court that Skakel would not be retried. And this is sadly where this case ends, 45 years after Martha Moxley had a fun night out celebrating Mischief Night with her friends and then she was murdered. 45 years later, and there is still no resounding justice 
for this victim. And maybe there never will be. John Dodson, and this has been The Secret Sits. We dance round in a ring and suppose, but The Secret Sits in the middle and knows. Audio Engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Logo Artwork provided by Tony Lay.